Okay, guys, here we are. We are live with Jeff Saltenstein right before he gets snowed in tomorrow. Yeah. So if you can send them a care package tonight, he'd appreciate that because he's in Denver and you got some weather coming in, right? The snow is coming in. Hold on just a minute. Okay. Hold on. What's up? You need oh, we're good. Thanks. Sorry. We got family. We got kids. We got everything going on over here. You, you got everything going on. Yeah. What's, we we want to know about that. What's going on? Well, I, I have a girlfriend and she has children. And so they were saying hello. Oh, oh here awesome. we are. Yeah. That, um, that's the Topspin Pro. Topspin Pro, Keisha. Yeah, so, she's become world famous now in the tennis market with uh, with the Topspin Pro. Uh, but yeah, we got we had five inches of snow coming. It's 60 degrees here. I just was on the court for a couple of hours. Um, I, I work with a junior tennis player that's going to go play at a high level division three school next year. So we did a lesson and then I work with a, an adult client who's a 4.0 who wants to learn a professional serve. So we are just breaking it down and she's making great progress. So it was fun to be out there today. That is really, really cool. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get into growth mindset into mm -hmm. get ready for the match. I know you're big on that, but you know what else I know you're big on. So I'm counting on you because okay. what I discovered is the tennis industry as a whole, tennis coaches don't know anything about music. I don't know if you watch any of my live streams, Jeff, but Maribon doesn't even know who, you know, Billy Joel is, the Eagles. He's got no idea. Okay. And then shockingly, last night, Jeff Green. Well, Mar Maribon is young. Maribon is not even, he's so young though. So he's I still young. Him, but you, yeah. you give him a pass. Okay. But Jeff Greenwald. Did not know Revolution by the Beatles. Wow. Jorge Capistani did not know Jimi Hendrix all along the Watchtower. All right. Now, I've seen your page, and I know you go to concerts. So all you're going right. to play a song, and I have to recognize it? You have to recognize it. Oh, man. Pressure's on. If Keisha was here, she could help because she's the pop culture queen. And, but and, and this is one of the most – Badass entries into a song ever. So I think you're just going to like nail it like okay. this. Are you ready? Let me know as soon as you know it. Guys, if you're out there, let me know when you guys know it. Oh. Yeah, Lenny, baby. See, but I, I have to sing the same know. of this song. Wait. wait. Oh, you don't uh, I can fly. Wait, I can fly? You're so close. Yeah, something about fly. Fly away. Fly away. Yeah. I had that, I have that, uh, CD. I'm a huge Lenny f fan and he's got some great, I haven't, I mean, I, I haven't memorized the names of his songs, but he's got a couple that are just kind of like under the radar songs that are ridiculous. But yeah. I was more of, so when you mentioned the Beatles, you mentioned Elton John, uh, well, and who else yeah. did you just mention? Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Beatles, yeah. You, that's a little more old school. So my, my, I know we're the same age, but <clears throat> my music taste growing up, it was, especially when I was a teenager, it was like Duran Duran and then uh, Guns N' Roses was my guy. So if someone, or my group band, so it was like, if you had to decide between Metallica or Motley Crue or Guns N' Roses, I was all in on Axl Rose <clears throat> and I saw Axl <coughs> perform a couple of years ago at Mile High Stadium in Denver, but I'm more like Guns N' Roses. Um, Do you want to get some water? I, I know you're yeah. eating that bar. <clears throat> Choking. I got bars. I got jerky. I got peanut butter cups, the healthy <laughs> ones. Do you have water? I have a little bit of water here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Get some water. Cause I, I know how those bars are. They can get dry and all of a sudden you're in, in a bar. Yeah. So anyway, Guns N' Roses. That's, that's, uh, but yeah, Lenny, love Lenny. Yeah. Bye -bye. Well, very cool. I knew you'd nail it. I knew you would. So David Lee, I think he's been, you know, the cool thing about David Lee is he's actually uh, a kid who started playing high school tennis, just went, just picked it up. And now he's number one singles player. And he's been on every single live stream we've had this week. Everyone. Well, the fact that he can recognize that that we're two of his favorites uh, right away puts him in the A list, you know, yeah. for him to, to just toot our horns like that. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to talk about mindset. I know you're very, very big into that. Um, 
when did you start studying it? Like how much do you, you talk about it a lot, but like, are you somebody who is some into meditation? Are you into mantras? Like, are you sitting on a, on a mountain somewhere like this? Like, where are you in the guru spectrum of mindset? Because I'm having a tough time figuring out where you are in that. I know it's important to you. I know you talk about it a lot, but I, mm. I, I don't know how deep down the rabbit hole you are in all this stuff. Right. So, uh, I want to start with a story, if that's okay, Pete. Yeah. And you probably, you're aware of a portion of the story. I don't know if you've actually heard it before, but I want to take you back to 1997 when I'm playing Michael Chang. And uh, it's a second round match, 24,000 inside of Arthur Ashe Stadium. It's my first time on the big stage. I had played Thomas Mooster a month before at the Canadian Open. He was number two in the world. It was a TV net match, Cl Cl Cliff Drysdale. So I, I had played a big match, but... You know, U.S. Open, under the lights, John McEnroe on the call. <clears throat> and I start that match against Chang, who's two in the world. And I started pretty nervous. But somehow with the with the big serve, I held serve a couple of times. And I found myself at two all. And I, I remember taking that first deep breath and just relaxing into the match. And for the next 20 minutes, I just started balling. I was taking it to Chang. And I arrive at set point. It's 5-4. 40, 30. And I go with my nasty lefty slider that you hit so well, Pete as well. And I stretch Chang and I hit a beautiful backhand angle volley to win the first set. And the crowd absolutely erupts. I remember one guy standing up, he's in his suit and he starts pointing at me. He's probably in his fifties. He's like pointing at me as if, where did this guy come from? Who yes. are you? Like, this is my arrival, right? On the big stage up yeah. a set on Chang. And I remember backpedaling from the net after the volley, the points over, the crowds erupted. And then I, I had this huge shit, shit ass. I'm sorry for yeah, this, shit ass a, eating grin on my yeah. face. And um, I tell people that's when the match ended. I know that blows my mind that you say that. And, and people are like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, here's the deal. The dominant thought in my mind in that moment was, Phew, thank God you didn't embarrass yourself in mm. front of the world. And so I like to tell that story and I ended up losing in four sets. I didn't embarrass myself. Uh, I acquitted myself nicely. It was a very entertaining match. It's a match that I'll remember forever and one of my signature matches in my career. But what I, I like to share that story because you have this um, juxtaposition of here I am, this elite athlete, went to Stanford, national champion, playing top 50 in the world tennis on that night. And yet my limiting beliefs kept me from tapping into another level, kept me from maybe pushing the envelope and actually finding a way to overcome Michael Chang on that night. And so uh, it's a little bit of vulnerability. It's a little bit of um, a little to show that I had the star power, but I also had that weakness, that kryptonite. And so that story to me just embodies really what all of us experience on some level, whatever level we're at, that there's a part of us that aspires for more and wants to be great. And then there's that little self, that little person inside of us that plays small. And when yeah. I was thinking about not embarrassing myself, I was playing, playing small. Um, so, you know, segue into where I fall into this whole journey is that, uh, shortly after that time, I, I had a lot of injuries and I was essentially off the tour for two years because of misdiagnosis and surgeries. And so from the age 24, 25, when I was supposed to take off, I had signed with an agent, my career was about to take off. I had these injuries and it was at that time that I started studying all things high performance. So I'm 25 years old and I'm now starting studying nutrition. I'm studying mindset, I'm studying spirituality, I'm studying um, athletic development, technique. And so liter literally I've been studying all of this for 20 plus years and so I have the in the kind of the in the trenches. I've done a lot of things. I've tried a lot of things. Speaking of, you know, meditation and other things, I've gone to different retreats and workshops. I've been to the Joe Dispenza retreat uh, twice where you basically meditate five hours a day. Um, I've never done one of the 10 day Vipassanas, but um, I've explored meditation. Um, I can't say that I have a regular practice. Um, but what I think is really important is for people to find something that works within the framework of their life. And 
you know, if you meditate 20 minutes a day, but then you're still irritable the other 23 hours, that doesn't really make sense to me. <laughs> That's a good point. So I would rather be the guy that doesn't meditate, but then still shows up in a way that is an integrity and uh, with a presence that someone that who kind of has their act together. And so you can obviously go deeper down the rabbit hole with a lot of meditation if you want. But I find that, you know, I'm certified in something called heart math. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, no. uh, but basically they've been studying um, heart rate variability for 25 years and they've gone into companies and they've worked with athletes. And essentially, if you can regulate your heart rate, if you can um, tap into that breathing and that sense of peace um, throughout your day. So if it's like a one minute meditation and you do that five times a day, that may even be better than doing meditation once in the morning. So it's really finding those spaces throughout your day to be able to do that. And, and I try to do that, um, try to find that space to do that as much as I can. Hmm. So you're explain the heart rate thing again. That kind of went, sure. so yeah. how does that work? Sure. So, um, uh, the, the technology is called heart math. Uh -huh. And it's the name of the company. They've been around for years. And uh, basically what they're trying to do is help people in corporate and in athletics um, find a state of resilience, s find a state of emotional balance. And boy, do we need it in our world today with mm -hmm. everything swirling, you know, coronavirus, yeah. the election, politics, the economy, this is a time when a lot of people are very stressed out and stress is actually the number one cause of disease. 80% of all doctor visits are related to stress. Hmm. Uh, you know, so developing resiliency and emotional balance is one of the keys to success in anything in life and, and, and anything you do in life. And so heart math there, they actually have sensors. Um, you, I have a portable sensor you can hook up to your ear and then you have an app on the phone and you do breathing, uh, you just slow down your breathing. And what they found is that if you focus on a renewing emotion like compassion, love, appreciation, you can find that heart rate, that balanced heart rate variability where you can find that um, sense of calm. But if, you, if you're angry or frustrated or sad and they were to actually check your heart rate variability, it's all over the place. Hmm. So basically it's just a tool and there's a lot of tools out there, but it's a powerful tool to be able to practice getting into that, what they call a coherent state and how that relates to tennis players is that, and you know, this Pete, if you're in an incoherent state, if you're angry, if you're frustrated, if you're tight, if you're tense, uh, if you're up in your head, then you, there's a really hard time. You have a hard time finding the zone. And so the zone that these athletes are finding, they're actually, if they were to look at their heart rate, uh, the heart rate still elevates, but it, uh, it's more regular pattern and they're in this coherent state. And that's what the zone is. And yeah. so the players that are able to find that zone uh, are, are the ones that are more successful. And most people are, as you know, are in incoherent state when they're on the court. Yeah. Negative self-talk, their body's very tight. They don't know how to manage their emotions. So we want to help people practice those tools. Yeah, I think that's super important. You know, when I was growing up, a lot of the best players always had an angry scowl on their face. You mm. know, McEnroe and, and Connors, although Connors is a little more goofy from time to time, you know, Lendl. And so I always thought my job was to go out there and just be like walking around like that the whole time. And through interviewing so many great experts, especially at TennisCon this year. I mean, it's amazing how many times, like Rick Macy talked about the importance of smiling, being able to smile. You know, like if you can't smile in a match, you're too nervous or you're too just like amped up. And I think if you would have asked me when I played to smile, I'd be like, you know, screw you, I'm in a match. Like, don't even talk to me. You know, like that was kind of the way I was on the court, even though off the court, I'm one of the most laid back guys you can, you can start talking to. So, I think that as competitors, we've kind of like got it backwards for many years, just based off maybe past role models we've looked at. Is is, is what do you think about that kind of idea? Yeah, I, I think you touched on something very powerful in that when we watch our the best athletes in the world, they're not really smiling that much and they look pretty intense out there. And so then we see that and we say, well, that's how we need to be. 
But I actually agree with you. I think most of us club players and aspiring players should learn to smile a little bit more and not take this so seriously. Because if you're in a practice or a practice match, you're probably taking it less seriously and having more fun when you're practicing than when you're in that league match, when you're in that really intense match. And I guess I would want to see if someone could try to uh, emulate more of that feeling of having more fun and being free in practice. Cause you're already, the tension's already elevated. Uh, you know, your tension's elevated in a match. You're, you're more tense. So you have to find ways to almost care less. Uh, you know, some of the athletes that I work with on the performance side, on the mental side, what I find most of the time is that they, they are too tense. They're too afraid to miss. They're too afraid to make mistakes. They've got to make balls because what have we been taught as tennis players? You just need to make one more ball. Mm. When I hit some of my best shots on the tour, I know this is going to sound crazy, but it's a little bit of reverse psychology. And most people, when I tell them to do this, they don't quite grasp it and they don't embrace it. But I would tell myself before a big point, try to miss. Hmm. go ahead and miss. It was just my way of taking the breaks off of whatever you do. You have to make this return. You have to make this ball because when I thought that way, I found it clinched me up. Yeah. So you got to find ways to kind of, I look at it. It's like a pattern interrupt. Obviously you and I, we do marketing too. We understand the power of a pattern interrupt of being able to get someone's attention by doing something that's not normal. So something that's not normal would be to tell yourself it's okay to miss. How yeah. often do people actually tell themselves it's okay to make a mistake? Yes. It's the opposite, right? It's always yeah. like, don't make unforced errors. You made too many mistakes. You need to make more balls. It's never about it's okay to miss or go ahead and actually try to miss. And I remember one story, uh, Pete, that I'll, I'll finish with before, you know, I know you probably have more questions, but I was playing a challenger event in Champaign, Illinois. I love telling this story because I, I had a tendency as a, as a player to get tight and get short with my swings. So mm -hmm. I know people can relate to this. And here I am playing, you know, again, pro probably highest level of the game. I'm 150 in the world. I'm playing challengers, lots of future stars in these tournaments. And I'm playing a first round match and I'm hitting short. And I, I feel the tension like I'm doing this all the time. That's the worst feeling. It's a terrible feeling. And I played way too many matches like that because I'm a recovering perfectionist. Um, so I need to keep practicing messing up. And so uh, I'm playing this match and it's an inside court. And on the back tarp, right above the tarp, about 30 feet in the air, you have all the banners in the Big Ten. So this was in Champaign, Illinois. So you had Illinois, you had Ohio State, you had Michigan, you had Michigan State. And I swear to you, Pete, I would look up at the banners and I would say, I'm going to swing for the banners. Mm. I'm in a first round challenger match. There's people watching, there's umpires calling the score. And I had to go to that place and it freed me up. And I started hitting through my shots and I kept telling, you know, Ohio state, okay, I'm playing the point and you're so tight as it is. You're not going to hit to the banners. If you hit, if you have top spin and you extend the ball actually drops in the way it's supposed to, it does what it's supposed to do. Yeah. I ended up winning that match and then I went on and won the whole tournament. And so I could have easily lost first round. We call them trunk slamming where you lose first round, you slam the trunks in the racket and you drive away from the courts and it's over. That could have been a trunk slamming week and it ended up being one of the most memorable weeks of my life. Yes. That's a, you know what I actually, as you were talking and uh, I know one of your, your good friends and who you coach for a while too, James McGee had a, a similar kind of, experienced and, and as I as I thought about it and and you let me know what you think um tennis has got to be one of the toughest most unfair sports to make it on the pro tour because you go from somebody who is like slugging your own bags slamming the trunk like you say to all of a sudden you get hot you make it to the big time and then all of a sudden like oh here's your locker room at the U.S. Open and and you're just maybe getting enough funding to get yourself there. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're playing against all these people who are already maybe more skilled than you. They're, they're legends and they've got a whole team around them. And, I, and, and everywhere they walk, they're probably like, can I get you this, Mr. Federer? Can I get you that, Mr. Federer? Can I do this for you? Would you like a back rub in two hours? Like 
it's like they have every advantage. It's not like a basketball team goes into, a, a, you know, and they all have the same experience. Tennis players on the tour, especially ones trying to really break in, it, it's it's a completely different experience, isn't it? I mean, it's it's and it's almost, I would imagine, so hard to get the confidence to go, I belong here when you know how they're being treated and you know how you are living. Can you talk about that experience a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was one of those guys that did most of it on the on my own. And, you know, Joseph O'Dwyer, who helped me break the top 100 in the world, he would say to me, he's like, Jeff, I have no idea how you got to 100 in the world. Like, seriously, you did it basically alone. Like, I would take him maybe 10 weeks a year, but I didn't have a girlfriend most of the time. I was literally slogging this thing alone. And gosh, it is really tough to do it. And it's very tiring. And like you said, a lot of these players have the resources to have a team of one, two, three, four people around them. And that makes a huge difference. I remember playing Tommy Haas in Memphis. I played him on two different occasions. And in both occasions, I was on my own. Actually, I think one of them, Joe, might have been there. But one of them, I was definitely alone. And he had his coach and his trainer there. And that can be the difference between winning or losing 6-4 in the third. You know, Michael Chang, when I played him at the U.S. Open, he had his trainer in the box and his coach. I didn't have a trainer. I didn't know if I could go five sets and have the endurance that Michael Chang had. So just that psychological advantage that he has, knowing that he's done the work and he, he's got his trainer there, that they've done the work and that he can go five sets, that's a relaxing feeling. And so it's the, the pro tennis tour is set up uh, definitely top-heavy uh, you know, there's a lot of talk now about increasing the prize money because so many players can't afford to bring a team with them. You know, if you're making 200 K a year, if you're grossing 200 and your travel expenses are 80 uh, a year, and then you got to pay a coach another 80 or a hundred, you're, you're, you're losing money. And so that's impossible. You know, it's impossible. If you're a pro basketball player, you're in the bubble you know, for three months and you have every meal paid for, you have 10 coaches on your staff, everything's free. Plus you're getting paid $15 million a year. So it's, it's, it's our sport as being the most amazing sport in the world for so many reasons, we really have struggled to make it an economically viable career. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to segue a little bit back to the initial um, thing that I talked about a little bit about the, the small self and the big smell self or little me and big me. I really think it's like you touched on James McGee. The reason James McGee didn't make it as big as he could have got to 150 in the world. And the reason I didn't get to 50 in the world or 20 in the world, I didn't tap into that big self enough that, that person that, that, it's almost like you have to create, and this is one of the concepts that I like to teach, is you have to create an alter ego or a superhero that's not even you. It's not Pete Freeman. It's not Jeff Salzenstein. It's a, a, a character. It's an animal. And so Joseph actually gave me a nickname when I was 28 years old, and I was 180 in the world, and he started calling me the seagull after the book Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And the seagull doesn't follow the flock. He follows his own path and he just dive bombs and takes chances. And so I was already doing that up until 28 years old, but Joe gave me permission to embrace that more. And that ultimately helped me get to that hundred level, but I could have been an even bigger seagull. Russell Williams, uh, Russell Wilson, quarterback for the, for the Seattle Seahawks. His alter ego is Mr. Unlimited. He literally has a character that he calls on when he needs motivation or belief. And it's a character called Mr. Unlimited. And so many of us are not tapping into our superhero powers because we haven't created something bigger than ourselves. So we keep repeating what we've been doing over and over again based on our past history. And, you know, if I can help people understand that that's one of the most powerful concepts, you have to create a big self, a, a big me, a, an alter ego to live into and play make-believe if you want to break through. Yeah. I would imagine that, and it'd be interesting to almost do a study on it. I mean, I, I would think doing that kind of journeyman career to where one week you're at a park and barely anybody's there watching, and then the next week 
I mean, you've played a lot of big names. You played Taylor Dent, you know, Muster, Chang. I played uh, Songa, Nalbandian, uh, Tursinov, uh, Novak. Uh, what's not Novak Djokovic? I played uh, Space in His Name. Yeah, played a lot of guys. I know. Yeah, he was a great player, Novak. I mean, was it Yuri Novak? Yeah, was that yeah Yuri Novak. He played him, beat him. Come, yeah, yeah I mean, he had some big wins too. So, I mean, I beat, listen, I beat him in Luxembourg at 150K challenge. I'm over there in the middle of nowhere, Luxembourg. It's November, it's freezing cold. And I beat this guy, he's 20 in the world. And I beat him on the stadium court first round. And the second match, I the second round the next day, I played a guy 500 in the world and lost. Yeah. It makes no sense. I literally beat a guy 20 in the world day one. Day two, I lost to a guy 500 in the world. And I thought the guy 500 was better than the guy that was 20. Yeah. Like he was hitting shots that were better than the guy that was 20. Well, it, it makes no sense in a way. But then again, <laughs> one of the things that I always marvel at when I go to a professional tournament and you watch these players hit – like I've never seen that guy ever in my life, and I don't even know how it's physically possible to hit a tennis ball better than what I'm watching right now. Like I just – like the guy is perfect. I don't even know who he is, you know. And so there's so many people out there. That's what's so amazing now. Roger and, you know, Rafa, they just do it year after year, and they just seem to be so much better than everybody. But if you go to practice courts, you, you can't really see a difference sometimes. Um seems like when the match goes, I mean, especially when you watch Roger, it's just like another world. But but uh, anyway, so what I was going to go to this point, though, with you doing this, where you're you're one week maybe playing somewhere where not many people are watching, and the next week you're on the big stage, and you just do this your whole career, and you're trying to break through, and you're kind of getting there and kind of not. I would imagine that this really stays with people throughout their life. You know, this is about big mindset. I believe that this, especially knowing you, Jeff, I just wanted to make this more about tennis because I, I know that you're more about tennis. So so I would imagine that for so many, and you could probably do a study on this, it makes and breaks people's mindset. Like when you go through this experience, and you're like, I'm so good, but I just can't get there. I know that, like, what do I do after this? Like, what would you say? Do I mean, I would imagine if you can find a new thing like you've been able to do that you're probably would say, man, I am like, I'm nails from what I went through. What I went through, the loneliness, the fighting, the frustration, the injuries, like I am freaking just a rock. I mean, everybody's still vulnerable. But I mean, imagine you, you got to have built a lot of confidence. Would you say a lot of people who are, who didn't quite make it, they feel the same way and they usually get stronger and find great careers. Or would you say some of them, feel like, man, I put my whole life into this and I don't even know what to do now. And I'm crushed. Like, how does that go? And and do we have a lot of both stories? Yeah. I think, um, I think it's, it's a very thought provoking question. Um, I'm thinking of where I want to go with this. I, I've, ex there's a lot of mental health issues on the pro tour. There's a lot of people that are struggling mentally. You lose every week. Um, you don't live up to expectations. There's, there's depression, there's frust, you know, there's frustration, there's drug use. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there, just like in the world right now, there's a lot of mental health challenges. And so, uh, you know, what, who's this, the swimmer, um, that one helps. Yeah. I mean, he's literally the, the spokesperson for mental health now. And this is arguably the greatest athlete of all time. And he's really struggling with his mental health or has in the past. Right. And so there's a lot of that out there. And I think what has separated me from someone who maybe tried really hard and didn't make it. And like, what do I do next? Um, there's a couple of factors. One, I'm very fortunate that I had a solid upbringing. So a lot of people aren't that fortunate. I have parents that were very supportive. A lot of kids and players didn't have that. They didn't have parents. They had parents that were hard on them or abusive. So that's a huge trauma or psychological challenge. To, so I had that foundation. I think I was lucky that I wasn't a phenom right away. So no one ex nobody expected me to be a pro tennis player. I was five foot nothing as a 15 and a half year old with no serve. And so I kind of snuck up on people. So I was always kind of chasing Instead of being the one chased all the time, I was chasing. So I think that helped me. Obviously, going to Stanford and having Coach Dick Gould, who uh, ran his team with integrity and character. So it's like my foundation when I got on the tour at 23 and a, and a college graduate and probably not expected. And 
to be great, um, it, my foundation was pretty strong. And so I think where, where people fall by the wayside or really struggle is their foundation is not strong enough. So what would a foundation look like? And, and so I don't, it's not good enough just to talk about this foundation. I think it's important to come up with tools and strategies if somebody um, has the mental health or they're not able to bounce back or they struggle post-career. I think uh, strategies, number one is, and a lot of people have a hard time finding this. You and I found it. It's our purpose. It's our why. Simon Sinek has a YouTube video that talks about your why. So if you can, if you can take some time, if you're struggling with things to find your why, what gives you life, then that, that whole, those challenges start to melt away because you wake up every day with a purpose and the purpose doesn't have to be starting an online business like we did, but it sure helps, uh, starting your own business, but it could be just volunteering, uh, for a cause that you really believe in, but something that gives you purpose in life, uh, is a huge strategy. Um, I think people, people struggle, uh, with these mental health challenges, especially on the tour is uh, tangible things. Um, their self-talk is, is not very good. The, the story, the narrative they tell themselves they're they're again, they're playing small. They're playing the victim game. They're playing. Why me? Why does this always happen? I'm not going to name names, but there are pro tennis players that do that. There are Peter people in leadership positions around the world that, do not exhibit the, the qualities of character and integrity um, that are required to have a solid backbone and a solid foundation. And so I know Jim Lair just released a book, 40 Years of Research, and the number one trait of the most successful CEOs and, and athletes was character. And so there are great athletes out there winning championships, but they will fall and crumble and then they'll have to come back again if they don't work on the character and integrity side of things. It usually they, 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 they crumble, they, they, they struggle. So I just think having a, a building your foundation and being aware that you're actually uh, that, that you can make these changes and, and having tools to do it can make a huge difference. And I've already touched on a few heart math, you know, regulating your breathing, very important, developing that resilience, focusing on gratitude and that renewing emotion as part of that coherent state, your self-talk, so important, finding your why. I mean, those are three big ones right now. And the other one we talked about the other day is just getting out and sweating, you know, get out and, and move because you'll get new ideas and new insights on maybe what's next in your life or in, with your career. Hmm, very good. Now, with all this stuff that you've talked about, let's let's kind of package it into, or I don't even know if it can be packaged, but let's yeah. kind of uh, package it into some life skills or some some life rituals or some daily routines. Do you just kind of live in the flow and you kind of know broadly what you want your life to be and what you're about? Do you have things written down like this is who I am and this is my why and 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 um, <laughs> Is, is there like certain checkpoints you're trying to do throughout the day? Like I'm getting up at this time, I'm exercising at that time, I'm gratitude at that time, or is this a general all around kind of being state that you want to have going? Where's yes, it? I'm. yeah, I'm more in the flow and being state. I tap more into that leftiness and artistry rather than structure. Uh, I just, you know, having to write things down and read it all the time. Um, I just, it's just not really my thing. Um, so yeah, it's more of a lifestyle and a, and a being and it, but it takes practice. There was a time that I definitely was more structured with it. Um, <clears throat> but it's interesting because I do get, I do get feedback from certain people that I'm close to that I, that I seem to have my act together. And yet I know behind the scenes, I'm not doing all these rituals. And so I think, again, it's really important. Like I'm working with a, a player right now that's going to be finishing up college and may try the pro tour. And I gave her a lot of ideas on how she can up her mental game. But I didn't give her a spreadsheet and say, you got to do this, this, and this. What I did is I said, here, here's four or five things I want you to consider. And then I want you to put it into your daily program and come back and tell me what you find, like what you notice rather than this rote way of doing things. So for people out there that are maybe 
haven't done this as long as I have or haven't had an awareness around it, I think it's important to create some specific things that you're going to do every day. Um, I think my one, I think one of my greatest strengths around all of this is that, and it's because I practice it so long is I just think my thinking pattern and my self-talk and the way I see the world is through that, that lens of possibility and through the lens of high performance. And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of things I could probably be doing better. I mean, we're all, we're all human, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that, I think that really just understanding who you are and understanding what you want to change and just knocking off a couple at a time Uh, a year and a half ago, uh, I've never been a big drinker, um, but I would have a couple drinks, you know, a a little bit of tequila, maybe some wine. And I went to a seminar and it it was called the alcohol free seminar. And I went because I wanted to see how he was running it, uh, how he was doing group coaching. And because I'm, I'm, I'm also kind of dabbling and in, in shifting into performance coaching and such. And I want to see how he did it. And at the end of the weekend, he said, okay, everybody, and this is not about being again, alcoholic or having addiction issues. It's just about lifestyle and performance. So at the end of the weekend, he says, Hey, raise your hand. If you're going to try 30 days, alcohol free, kind of like your 30 day challenges. Mm-hmm. And I'd say 75 to 80% of the room raised their hand. And I didn't raise my hand because that's my rebellious nature of like, mm-hmm. it's not going to tell me what to do. I'm yeah. not going to just do it because everyone else is doing it. Yeah. Then when I get home, it was like, Nick, it was gnawing at me. I was like, man, maybe I should just try it for 30 days. And sure enough, I did it for 30 days. You know, they say it takes 30 days or even 42 days to build a habit. And I didn't have alcohol for 30 days. And I went 30 and I said, you know what? I'll do another 30. It wasn't, that was easy. I'm it's not, did another 30 and now it's been a year and a half and I don't think I'll ever have another sip of alcohol again. There's no desire. Right. And so, um, I would encourage people to try to find something that they want to change and do it for 30 days, whether it's on the court or off the court. The first thing I would start with people on the court is most people's self-talk, you know, Pete, it's not very good. It's just not very self-serving self. It's not life-giving. It's not inspiring. And I always tell people, I'm like, okay, if you were coaching yourself, would you literally say you have the worst backhand? Would you, unless, I mean, you've got to fire that coach. Right. They're telling you as soon as you miss the backhand, oh my gosh, you always miss that backhand. Yeah. What are you doing? That's like the worst shot. Oh my (laughs) gosh. It's so windy out here. I can't even toss it. Like a coach would never do that. Actually, my coach did. (laughs) Well, okay. Well, somehow you came out on the other side. Okay. Um, (laughs) Maybe there's some trauma in there we need to look at, but I think it's important that people just start being there, like patting themselves on the back because literally you're not going to get better. If you keep telling yourself how bad you are, the, the mind, the mind will accept it as true. The more times you say it. So, and that's the same thing in life. I see a lot of people complaining about life or things that are wrong. You got to, our brain is wired to be negative. The reason why is because we're, it's a survival mechanism. It's, it's for, it's to, it's to ward off danger. So if we know that 80% of our thoughts are negative and we have 50,000 thoughts a day, guess what? We have a lot of work to do to change, to change our brain. We literally can change our brain. Our brain is plastic. And so I don't think people understand that. You mentioned at the beginning growth mindset, this is fixed mindset assumes that everything is going to be the way that it is. But a growth mindset assumes that things are malleable and can change and can adapt. And that's what makes uh, high performers so special is their ability to adapt and be flexible and be resilient and be, and be malleable and to flow. And so that's why I like to kind of flow. I have my certain practices that I do on a consistent basis, but it's not something that I do in a rote way. Yeah. So you t- you talked about playing big versus used to play small. And, and, I, and I really like that. So how would you say that you play big in life now? Like what, what do you do that is different than the Jeff before that maybe Jeff wouldn't have done before that you're kind of proud of and, and uh, that's important to you? Yeah. I mean, Jeff, Jeff has evolved over, you know, this little Jeff, middle Jeff, big Jeff has evolved over time. Right. And so 
if I think about um, 12 year old Jeff would uh, was much more of a perfectionist, was much more structured, was much more serious. And the older Jeff now is uh, a little more loosey goosey. I mean, I have my intense side, but a little more loosey goosey, um, more forgiving of my mistakes, willing to make more mistakes. Um, and that's just, yeah, knowing who I am, I'm just more willing to take some chances and uh, not crazy risks, but I mean, again, what you and I are doing is a risk, you know, waking up every day and trying to do an online business is it's not the norm. And so the fact that we have both done that, uh, that's, that's playing big to me. And, um, I would say, yeah, probably I'm more, I'm more artist. I'm more lefty. Um, and I think, you know, you and I probably take for granted what we just do on a daily basis, but you know, I've gotten to know my girlfriend the last year and a half we've been you know, dating and she, she just, um, she just, uh, got an idea. For, she's had all these ideas for a business, but she hasn't pulled the trigger on anything. And then she just set up her LLC this week, but I think it's taken her time, you know, maybe just hanging out with me, taking her time to actually take that next step because she's kind of, she was kind of in that place of not taking the step. And we just take steps. We just, we just do it, right? You and I, we just do it every day. We just do it. Yeah. And so I think that's, I mean, I've always been an action taker, but I think I do it in a more, uh, in a, in a more, uh, forgiving, loving, uh, for, um, uh, just open way and knowing that, you know, I'm going to learn from my mistakes. I wish someone would have told me when I was 10, a lot more, like, go ahead and miss this backhand and let it fly because I have a lot of this still in my backhand. It's years of trauma of not wanting to miss. But Andre Agassi and Mark Philippoussis were trained when they were five years old and 10 years old to crush every ball. Yes. I wasn't taught that. You might not have been taught that. So I think if, with, if we would have been from age six, just crush the ball with beautiful technique, we probably would have been better players without having to undo a lot of stuff. That's so true. I, I, you know, as you said that I'm thinking of, and I didn't go near as far as you went, Jeff. Yeah. but um, when I was 12, I was number one in the state and this other guy was number two. And the difference between him and me is in the beginning, like I just I actually turned out to be a certain value, but I just didn't miss. And I always had this thought of, you know, not missing and not, and he would swing for the fence, you know, kind of like the whole rod labors. And, and then all of a sudden it, it, it it flip flop. Once we got more developed, then he was always number one, and I was always number two. And I just could never beat him because he always hit the biggest shots at the most important moments. And maybe I was playing small, trying to just hope that my opponents would miss. Because when you're younger, that's what tends to win. And I think that that is also like you could. Get, I think the more I'm thinking about junior tennis and adult league tennis, like three point five and under is like 12 and under tennis. Like if you keep the ball in, if you just grind, if you do a lot of that stuff, people who are trying to do more of what you might want to play like or what you see on the pro tour, they're going to lose because they haven't developed that skill set far enough to just blow you off the court. But once, if they keep at it and if they keep doing the right things and they're determined enough, you can bet that, you know, in a couple of years, if you're somebody who's just always trying to win at that three, five level and just always be bragging to your friends that I'm just so great at three, five, that person who you've been beating for a couple of years, if they're working on developing their game, if they have that growth mindset, they're going to blow you off the court. It's not even going to be close. It doesn't strategy and all that doesn't matter. If, if you've got a frying pan grip serve and they've got the continental serve and they've got top spin, they're going to become the four Oh, four, five, maybe even five. Oh, and I'm talking, I've seen people over 40 do this over 50 do this. And I look at them like, wow, you know, like three fives and under they're like 12 and under tennis, uh, four fives and over. That's like the people who win at like 14, 16s and 18s and go to play college tennis. And, uh, so it's all what you want. If you want to win a lot of matches at three, five and under, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. 80% of people are there. And you'll you'll have a lot of friends again. Go watch who's go watch 12 and under tennis and see how they win. If you want to play 4-0, 4-5, 5-0 tennis, go watch a 16 under tournament and see who wins. And that's how you gotta 
decide how you're going to model your game. That's right. And, you know, to piggyback on that, I think the, the woman that I just gave a lesson to, we're working a lot on her continental grip and her shoulder turn and her trophy position. And I make her serve from a half serve and it's come a long way. And I'm, but I have the vision and she has the vision of really how it's going to look. And I know how determined she is. She's going to get it. I don't know if it's going to be in six months or three months or three years. She's going to get it. She's not going to stop. And I'm giving her the stuff, right? And she told me today, she's like, my league hadn't seen me. And I don't personally, I think she's doing great and it looks amazing like what we're doing, but her serve doesn't look better or harder than it was when she had frying pan. But she told me today, she's like, my league hadn't seen me for six months. And they, they were like, what did you do to your serve? It looks amazing. And she's like, I held serve every time. So she believes she, her serve is better, even though I, I don't think, I mean, it's better technically, but like speed wise, it's not there. So I'm like, wow, her team noticed. And a year ago, they were telling her, don't change your serve. You're a 4-0, sometimes a 4-5. And we don't want you to mess with anything. And she's like, nope, I'm doing it. Yeah. And so what, what you have to do when you're going through this process is you have to carve out the time. She Five days a week, she goes alone to work on her serve. Five days a week. I only see her once every month or two. So I see her one time and then she'll send me some videos sometimes. But this is her five days a week in her zone. But when you're working on this, you've got to spend this time to work on the growth mindset stuff. And then when you go play your matches, you have to make sure that you don't do the crazy stuff you can't do. I, 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 I eavesdropped on you and Jorge, and he talked about how you can do it in practice, but maybe you can't do it in a match yet. I think it's really important that you don't just go out and say, well, I'm working on hitting a hundred miles an hour because that's what a five Oh does, but you can't even hit it in. And then you go on the court and you lose one and one, and now you're defeated. Yeah. I think you have to be very smart and manage your skills depending on if you're playing a league match, you go compete and you do the little things that you think you can do. And then you go out on your own and you work on the four or five skills and the five O skills, knowing that this is your, this is your long-term future. Yeah. That's pretty cool. They got, I have taken 10,000 practice serves. I got a good serve. That's, that's hopefully it's the right kind of technique because we well, don't want 10,000 of the wrong technique. I have a feeling since he's watching online instruction, though, it's probably the right technique. We have a right. lot of people who are very determined. I mean, just think about the dedication that a lot of these people online have done this week. They, they've really went deep. They've studied. They're on every live stream. I mean, they really, really want it. And I, I really want to encourage you guys that I think it's one of the most rewarding things to do is to go deep on something. Like, don't let anybody, um, I don't know, kind of like poo-poo your dream of, even if it's just, it, it, you know, to some people like, well, it's just recreational tennis or whatever. Like, why are you so obsessed with this? Because you're obsessed with something that's very, very healthy. You know, it's, it's about being the best version of you. And I think that when you dive into that part, that that's when you feel the best about yourself. You know, like, I like eating ice cream. It feels great. You know, I love Baskin Robbins, but maybe the next hour I feel like crap physically. And then mentally I'm like, oh man, I'm a loser. I just ate a bunch of ice cream. What is wrong with me? You know, but those moments where I dig down and like what the most proud time of the year for me is tennis con. Like I'm just so proud that we bring all these people together. I'm so proud of the, the grind that I have to go through. And I was listening to, and I mentioned this uh, earlier because I, I don't know how many people are still back from this one, but I just happened to stop a, a across a Matthew McConaughey video where he was talking about Dallas Buyers Club and how, you know, the person kept asking him, how hard was it? How hard was it? And he was like, it was easy because I was looking for something to get obsessed with. I was, I like the process of grinding and going deep. And he's like, for me, I would go deep. And then I had to say to myself, I have to go deeper. Like I couldn't go deep enough. And the more that you guys are looking at that for your game and for your life, you're going to go further. There was a lady who wanted to come to a camp and I just said, I don't think my camp's for you. Like she was begging almost to come to the camp. And she, and, and cause she kept saying, if I come to your camp, 
am I going to be a 4 0? I've been stuck at 3 5 for years. If I come to your camp, am I going to be a 4 0? I'm like, well, it's really not about, it's not about being labeled. I'm like, you're probably going to improve. You're going to learn things. If you go home and work on it, you're probably going to keep getting better. But I can't tell if you come to my camp for two days, you're going to walk away being a 4 0. It's not a certificate you guys get. It, and, and the 4 0, the, if you're 3 5 and all of a sudden you find yourself a 4 0 or 4 5, it's not. The results came because you didn't really focus on becoming a 4.0. You focused on the what it takes to do that. Yes. The, the idea that you said 4.0, it's the same thing when a, when a player says, I want to be top 100 in the world. That's great to have that goal. But I find that if that expectation that's set, the expectation, am I going to be a 4.0 after this clinic? That's a fixed mindset. That's a result focus. And if people can say, I want to be a 4-0 and then find the, find the information to get there, that's great. But I think people spend too much time obsessing over getting to 4-0 instead of obsessing over finishing high on the forehand because I have a tendency to go down like this when I'm nervous. And so if you become automatic here, you have a better chance of getting to 4-0. And they need to spend 80% of their time focusing on the little skills or the strategies or the mindset stuff and find the victories in that instead of the victory in becoming a 4-0. That's again, that's the, um, that's the destination, not the journey. Yeah. And so it's really, you want to keep those blinders on of like, okay, let's get a little bit better today. What are we going to get better? Okay. I'm going to work on my balance today on my forehand. And tomorrow I'm going to do it. And I'm also going to work on staying through my volleys a little bit. And I'm going to get better at that today. And whatever happens, happens. But I'm just going to get better at these skills today. And tomorrow I'm going to do the same thing. And then that's it. Like that's, that's your tunnel vision of like, I'm just going to get better today. And, you know, I think you and I both have probably have goals with our online businesses and where we want it to go. But I think we both have a handle on every day. You just show up and you put in the work. Yeah. And that's what people should be embracing is like the, the fun of that day getting better. That's it. And yeah. that's, I think what the best athletes in the world do. I don't think Rafa Nadal gets caught up in winning his 13th French open. I mean, or 15th or 20th of all people, he knows he's got to defend the French open every year. And it just looks to me like he's just a hundred percent immersed in the process of playing that point the way it's supposed to be played. And then he plays the next point and it, and it adds up to two weeks and he wins sl another slam. Yeah. That's amazing how those guys are able to really focus like that. Yeah, that's really cool. Let, let's end this with a little bit of fun because I've, I've heard some people ask and I, I know they'll be curious about both our opinions. Okay. Federer, Nadal, Djokovic. Out of those three, who is, you know, the most mentally stable, tough, like who is it or does it depend on what you're talking about? Yeah. So you want me to go first? I do. So I think the person who's made the biggest uh, improvement is Novak Djokovic. Uh, if you look at when he was three in the world behind those guys, he, he, he had a lot of mental challenges. And he was able to get into the meditation and the Zen and the holistic approach to training and life. And he has become probably the most mentally tough um, when he is in that right space. So I would say that if you put, if you put, if they're all on their A game with their mental game, I think Djokovic is the guy, but he still has too many times of weakness where he loses his, you know what? And so overall, I would say the whole body of work and the level of professionalism and mental toughness in clutch for me is an adult. And um, the, so it's almost like Djokovic has more top end, but, but Nadal is the same guy that he was been since he was 18 years old. He's just the same mental beast. So strong. Yes, he's had a little blips where I think he lost his forehand in Barcelona for two weeks. Um, but he's been just since 18 years old, he's steady, whereas Djokovic has been more up and down. But he his ups are like when he's when he's locked in, 
not on a clay court. Djokovic, I mean, Nadal. Nadal looks like a deer in headlights against him when he's locked in he, at the Australian Open. Federer looks like a deer in headlights. So for me, the top end is Djokovic, but Nadal is the most mentally stable and consistent all the time. Yeah, yeah. And all three of them are ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It just it just goes to show we get so just used to it. Like, oh, yeah, they're always in the fun. I mean, look at any pro – and we're literally having to look because they've just been so dominant. We're literally looking like 20 years now. I mean, we're talking about 20 years. Look at any other professional in on the men's or the women's side. You go Nadal, Djokovic, Federer, Serena Williams. Then any other pro you want to talk about on the men's or the women's side to show you how tough this is. When they win something, they rarely back it up ever. Like if they win a grand slam, which rarely happens, right? All of a sudden they're gone for like the next six months. Even if they win, you know, a Masters five hundred or thousand or whatever, you look at their next two months, and all of a sudden you see a bunch of like first, second round losses. It's like it's unreal how lo how long they've stayed on top, and you just can almost pencil them in for a semifinal or final every time. That's right. You know, I'm hard. I'm actually hard on Federer around the mental game because obviously we're splitting hairs, but he's got what, 20 slams? I mean, I think he's left at least five on the table. Yeah. Del Potro, uh, Del Potro at the U.S. Open, Djokovic when he was stretched out on the forehand return at the U.S. Open, the Wimbledon last uh, year and a half ago, and there's a couple others in there. Uh, there was a, there was another Wimbledon, I think, where he lost to Kevin Anderson. One round. So, so, and then if you look at his break point conversions against the field, he's not good. And especially against those top two. So I really think, and I've, I've said it for years. I think there's a blip, uh, believe it or not, there's a blip in Federer around, uh, around this and best tennis player of all time to, to hold a racket in terms of artistry and magician and, and uh, success. But imagine if he was like a Nadal or a Djokovic at the top end of the mental side, he would have at least 25. Yeah. At least. Oh, yeah. So I, I've seen him, you know, even uh, one year at Indian Wells, he, I think he lost to Dominic Team, maybe, but he literally on the big points would try these crazy drop shots. And I'm like, you're the greatest player of all time. And you're literally hitting a drop shot that, that coach Pete would admonish you for like, yeah. what are you doing? And it's five all in the third deuce. You need to hit that forehand. Yeah. So, so gosh, again, you're like, that just shows that there's still nuances. There's still levels for these yeah. guys. And uh, yeah, it's, um, I think that's why people love Federer so much, though, because he's got that yeah. perfection side of him, but then he's got that little vulnerable side where you feel mm -hmm. sorry for him a little bit, and uh, it's he's an interesting person to watch. To where you you definitely it's like he's like perfect, so you, why would you feel sorry for him? But then he's got this side of him where you can you can see him get nervous and struggle. Um, yeah, Wimble that Wimbledon, he was nervous in the tiebreakers, and Djokovic knew his game better and knew his strategy better, better than Federer. But I also think it's only, and, and I don't discount how much work Federer has done on his game, his even probably his mental game. But it's almost like things have come easier for him, and so when the going gets tough, he's used to easier. Whereas Djokovic has had so like he's like a workmanlike player, and Nadal too. They almost have to know they have to work so much harder on this because they don't have as much talent as Federer. And so there's not as much, I would think, maybe not as much growth mindset with Federer because he's like, hey, I'm just good. Like, I'm just loose and good and whatever. I, I, again, I'm downplaying it because I know he works tremendously on his game. But I just think that Djokovic and, and even Nadal went on these journeys for the mental side. Um, I'm pretty sure, you know, talking to some people behind the scenes, I know a performance coach that may have worked. I don't want to, I can't confirm it, but he said he worked with Nadal, Tony, Uncle Tony like 20 years ago, helping him create that alter ego um, where he's basically, he's a different person on the court than he is 
off the court, you know, he's humble and quiet off the court on the court. He's like a raging bull. Yeah. And they created that uncle Tony created that persona for him. And it, and it allows him not to be that soft, compassionate, kind person off the court. Yeah. He's just a bull on the court. And so that, that was designed. That was not luck. That was all. And I don't know if a guy like Federer has spent that time creating an alter ego. He's just Roger Federer. Yeah. I always joke to my girlfriend. I'm like, I just pictured Nadal growing up in the backyard with like a Snoopy house tied to <laughs> tied with a chain and Uncle Tony throwing out like meat. Like, there you go, Rafa. I'll see you tomorrow on the court at 7 a.m. Yeah. Making him carry the bags, making him uh, clean the court. All of these yeah. little humble things that, that of humility and of character that he developed, it, it's pretty amazing what they've done. I think they should, you know, if they should bottle up what they've done and and sprinkle it to the world. Uh, you know, seeing all these kids growing up in America that feel entitled and don't don't work. Like Nadal's won more than anybody, and he's the most humble guy out there. Yeah, he's super cool, man. This is awesome. I could literally go on for hours with this. Right. But uh, the good thing, though, Jeff, he's he Jeff's going to have a great night. He's going to settle in uh, with the family there, w wait for the snow to come. So it's a magical time. So I'm sure Jeff's excited to get back to that, too, although I know he loves this. And I'm, I'm putting in his link. So he's got a special link that if you um, go to and get Tennis Con for lifetime access uh, to the end of the weekend, you're going to get his kick serve secrets, which is awesome i mean we talked for an hour we did we talked guys and we watched a little bit of video but people love just the talk on the kick serve so jeff has a course where you go through get all his kick serve secrets he's got the sick kick and <laughs> um i gotta hop off here because we're going right right away be ready go to my youtube channel and be ready for gg in fact you know what i'll do the last thing i'll do is i'll find the gg video the, the video we're about to go on i'll pop it in the link here and um, we're going to go live with Gigi in 15 minutes. She's probably already waiting for the link. And the last thing I want to do in the world is get get Gigi Fernandez, 17-time Grand Slam champion, upset at me because she's a competitor, Jeff. Yes, she is. She doesn't mess around. She doesn't. Ask her, ask her who ask her who her alter ego is on the court. I don't. She is. She, I would love to know her character. She's she's got yeah. She's a winner. She is a winner. She is a winner. Um, here is GG link upset at me because she's a competitor, Jeff. That's oh, you know what? No, that is Jeff's link. I'm about to put Jeff's link in. I'm about to make a complete mistake here. Uh, Jeff, if you want to hop off, you can. I'm yeah, just gonna... I'll hop off. See you later. All right, man. You take Thanks, care. Everybody. Take care. Bye. You were awesome today. Thank you. Bye. All right, guys. I'm going to find the GG link and then I gotta hop off real quick. This is super fun, and and uh, of course YouTube is like taking forever. I'm super stressed all of a sudden. All right, uh, I gotta have that play big mindset that Jeff was teaching. All of a sudden, my YouTube, my like internet has like slowed down to like nothing. All of a sudden, you should see this. It's crazy, um, but I'm typing in my own channel to find that link. And and if you're on my email list, you can go and find the DG link. And uh, be ready. We're going to go live in, in less than 15 minutes. So let me find Gigi's special link here. I'm getting in there. You guys, I appreciate, appreciate you guys being part of this amazing day. We went live with Tennis Express. We're going live tonight with um, Mirabon. And come on. Come on, let's do this. All right. Now, come on, Pete. Get clutch here. Find the GG video. Oh. Where is it? There's the GG video. All right. I found the link. I'm going to pop it into the chat. All right. So we're going to pop this GG, GG link in there. Boom. All right, that is, do you guys see the link? I'm going to put it right here. That's the link. That's where we're going to be live with GG. You can take a screenshot or just go to my YouTube channel. Just type in Peter Freeman Tennis. Um, if that doesn't, if you don't find it there, type in like GG Fernandez Live. We're going to be live with GG real soon. And uh, I'll see you guys. All right.
right, you guys are awesome. Take care.